Ready when you are, Todd, to start letting people in. Oh, please, yes, go ahead, yeah. Thank you. Andrew, you have that? Sorry, do you have what? Start the webinar. Yes, I will start the webinar now, going live. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Todd Fernandez with Climate Crisis Policy and I'll be your host today. Thank you all for joining us to discuss the most important organizing challenge humanity has ever faced. How to unite in common cause, to join as one humanity, to protect our sacred planet. To open this session, I'd like to welcome Reverend Rashinda Fairhurst, who wears many hats, to uh, provide us with our opening convening remarks. Welcome, Reverend Rashenda. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, thank you, Todd. So I wanna say good morning and afternoon, and I want to take this moment in this faith setting to greet you all and thank you for being here. It is like we're all in one big house together, uh, sitting together, listening to together and holding space for that one fine thing that unites so many across so many disciplines and traditions, and that is hope. In this word of opening, we are going to speak that word hope. And I speak this word from my home in Southern Oregon, the home of the Tekelma and Shasta people. And I light, I lit this candle at the start of our time together in respect to the many traditions of light. The candle is set in the snow melt water of Crater Lake, which rushes down Mount Mazama through the forests of white fir, mountain hemlock and ponderosa pine to fill the four great rivers of Southern Oregon. I have sprinkled the flame with the ash of the Friday palms of repentance. Uh, there is not, I think, a general recognition of just how many people of faith are so deeply involved in the climate and creation justice movement. I want to invite interested people of faith to follow up this good, good conversation with an opportunity to meet together uh, on a date yet to be determined for uh, during the second part of January for an interactive discussion and exploration of climate and faith together. And I'll add that follow up information in the Q&A. So let us pray. God of all planetary things, God of heaven and of earth, God of carbon, cycler, orchestrator, maker and creator, thank you for the unimaginable gift that is this planet. And thank you for this, these tiniest atoms that are everywhere within it. Teach us to value the balance of the carbon atom in the air, in the water, soil, stones, and forests. Reset our human understanding away from greed and toward right living. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rashenda, and for all the amazing work Oregon activists are doing and how you coordinate and for bringing Senator Merkley to the symposium. Again, it's a model for the country and I'm very grateful. Welcome again, everyone. As you know, this is session five out of six, plus a cabaret tonight at eight. It's been a very lovely journey. Here's a brief overview. 
In the first session, we had a great gathering of elected officials and other leaders who endorsed the idea of a collective comprehensive bill, which was a huge thing, while also focusing us on more immediate goals. The upshot was an enthusiastic invitation for massive outside pressure. And that's where we all come in. In session two, we welcomed a wonderful array of leaders from major environmental and science organizations. And MIT and Project Drawdown offered to lead a scientific advisory committee to assess the greenhouse gas impacts of proposed bills. And the group generally agreed that there was a need for greater coalition infrastructure to unite all the various circles, perhaps with a climate Congress convening of all parties or a coalition of coalitions. In session three, we welcomed a wonderful array of leaders from a variety of areas, farming, environmental justice, unions, lobbying groups, teachers, doctors, indigenous women and in faith. And we had a fascinating conversation about the various focuses there. In session four, that was this morning, I think, we had an amazing array of big coalitions, environmental justice and psychiatrists. And that conversation today was just wonderful and digging into what coalition frameworks, visions and ground game we have already going and how we can merge those. And now we come to the faith and indigenous session. And I feel I can relax into the comfort I feel every time one of our faith members talks, centering our well being and mutual care. It's a nice contrast to my lawyer brain sometimes, and it grounds us back in community and spirit. Our conversation is still generally the same. What is the federal legislative strategy, the national federal climate legislative strategy? And perhaps more importantly for this session, how do we unite the faith communities? and civil society more broadly in common effort? And how do we make sure the processes for drafting a comprehensive bill is inclusive and transparent? And how do we bring all the sectors together for each other's missions and the whole? The level of faith involvement in the climate movement is my greatest source of hope. Um, the motivation to protect paradise from the love of money is the essence of this moment. It's biblical really as man's greed brings nature's wrath on humanity, the storms, fires, baseball-sized hail, tornadoes that stretch for miles, and floods sweeping away our farms and are destroying our cities. It's happening all because of our pollution right now. And yet we still haven't managed to stop it. I think the faith in indigenous communities can stop it. If we unite across faiths and beliefs, you have the gravitas and very importantly, the in-district communities to make elected officials heed the call and do the right thing. And your purity of intention is unassailable. On a personal level, I am uh, moved to this work by spirit to help protect and speak for the voiceless. And coming into this place has been a complex journey that started in Africa 2008, when I ended up back in the closet as a gay man and living in abject fear in Ethiopia. I came home traumatized and later realized that I had experienced the same trauma as a child, but had long forgotten it. Thankfully, I found my way to the Naraya, a Native American ritual that has been shared to help heal the two-spirit community, the gay community. In that ritual, I experienced spirit directly as a lived reality. And I eventually came to realize that if spirits existed outside of us as our ancestors and angels, that I too was a spirit. And that was a, a very deep blessing. Spirit once told me that the earth is not here for us. We are here for the earth. And I see this as the calling of our time to protect her, our mother, our creator, and all our siblings, the trees and animals, water and air from harm, to protect earth from harm. So this is the challenge we face and it's no easy task. Can humanity unite to stop 100 corporations from destroying paradise? Or will we continue to bicker amongst ourselves about every small detail until it's too late? For this, we need a plan for unity. And I feel the faith community could be the core of that unity. Turning back to the more technical conversation, um, in the other symposiums, we made a lot of progress, as I said, deciding really to work together to create a comprehensive bill through an inclusive and transparent process. So the intention of this gathering is already manifested in a beautiful way. And it seems like we're embarking on that journey and that of macro coalition building. So I'll just reiterate briefly some of the reasons for this approach, approach and, and why we wanna form a common big dream bill. 
first it'll set the solutions in writing. So we know, all know what we need to do. This clarifies our intention so we can pray and lobby together so we can manifest it. I believe you have to know what you want in order to manifest it. And we need the details to really forge common ground beyond the generalities. It'll also establish the gold standard to inspire mass, mass action and an uncommon valor. I know the activists in this space and they will stop at nothing once the demand is clear. The New York Climate Bill was a prime example as we were arrested many times and descended on the State House in Albany, which is far away from New York City, en masse multiple times. Shout out to New York Renews and Food and Water Watch and everyone who worked on that. And three, it'll be a vehicle around which to build a macro national coalition, like the immigration reform movement has, or healthcare. Building that coalition infrastructure is a critical piece. And again, I feel faith groups could help navigate that journey. And last, I believe we must draft this bill in civil society, must, civil society must lead this work. The challenge is not the opposition or the science. It's our ability or not as humans to put aside ego, personal and organizational, and find the way to positive collaboration. This is the essence of it all. Can we get along? We talk of peace and we have to let peace uh, begin with us and within the environmental movement and beyond. And this is the test we face as a humanity. Can we unite to save ourselves? And how are we gonna do that? So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Reverend Michael Malcolm, founder and executive director of the People's Justice Council. Um, I'm so grateful for that we've met and you lift me up already. And I know we're on the right path when you're here. And just thank you so much already. And it's only been a short time we've been in circles together, but I'm, I'm thrilled and grateful that you're here. Please take it away. Thank you, Todd. Um, let me first start off by saying, uh, or paying, uh, giving honor to the Choctaw and Chickasaw uh, indigenous tribes. Uh, here in Birmingham, on whose grounds I sit. Uh, but I also want to say, um, uh, I want to give a shout out to my, my ancestors on whose, on whose shoulders I stand. Uh, Todd, as you were speaking, I was reminded of my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was a bishop in the Pentecostal church. And uh, one day I got ready to preach right before he got up to preach. We were tag team preaching. And he told me, he said, um, before I got up, he said, make sure you leave some meat on that bone for me here. And, and, and Todd, I think when we were sitting in that green room, I probably should have told you the same thing and make sure you leave some meat on that bone for me. Because I think you took all my thunder. <laughs> uh, I had every intention on talking about everything you talked about. Um, as I got ready to prepare for my remarks and, and I looked up uh, what you talked about uh, with the climate legislative strategy, and I also thought about how I would present today, uh, I, I, I saw two things in this climate legislative strategy for uh, Joe Biden that really struck me where I see faith communities uh, should play a part. And I'll even talk about how the People's Justice Council and the Southeast Faith Leader Network are playing a part in modeling what it means for uh, those who are faith leaders and those who are people of faith and those who are even faithful to the environment coming together collaboratively to work on issues around climate justice and environmental racism. Um, there were two things that I saw. One was to build a stronger, more resilient nation. And the other thing that I saw was to stand up to the abuse of power by polluters who disproportionately harm communities of color and low income communities. And I need to tell you that though those in themselves were clarion calls to those who work in community to serve community in a very spiritual and a very real sense. 
because those spoke directly to who we are as a society and that we are those who are to be more resilient and to preach resilience and to preach strength and unity. But it also spoke to us as faith leaders who are there to be protectors and to ensure that those who are most vulnerable are protected. And I have to tell you, Todd, I have to tell you, Reverend Cal, we have not done a good job. We have not done a good job. We stand, uh, uh, we stand guilty of mistreating our responsibilities, mis uh, or abusing our responsibilities as communities of faith, as faith leaders. And my goal and my mission as the People's Justice Council is to right those wrongs and to call into account us as faith leaders to say that we have been given a mandate to take care of creation and those who know well should be doing better and we aren't doing our job. There's no reason why there should be a Black Lives Matter if all lives really matter. There should, there should be no reason why it should be a not in my backyard if we understand that it'll go in somebody else's backyard. In other words, we are taught to love our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is anybody that we come in contact with who has life, any entity that we come in contact with that has life. So it's not only dealing with the human uh, life, it's also dealing with planetary life. It's also dealing with all creature life. We are to protect those that have life. And this is what this organization or this network does by pulling together the tools that to pull people together and give them tools to uh, go back and advocate for policies that protect people that protect people and, and planet that ensures that people and planet are put first and not profit as I, as I end because I know my time is ending uh, let me leave you with this final thought just for me as I said, we are doing this already in the, in the Southeast. We've gathered together the Southeast Faith Leader Network, which is a group of us that are uh, uh, interfaith power and light uh, chapters, as well as creation justice ministries, and a collective of faith leaders throughout the Southeast. And we've come together to put out this clarion call to all those throughout the Southeast that we need to change this conversation. And we have the opportunity and the ability to change this conversation from it being economical, from it being political, to it being a moral issue. Is it right or wrong? Is it right or wrong that we leave people unprotected? Is it right or wrong that we leave the planet unprotected? Is it right or wrong that we know full well that we are making the planet inhabit in uninhabitable for those that are coming behind us? Is it right or wrong for us to continue in that vein? Should we be advocating for things to change? And that's what the People's Justice Council does as well. We provide tools and access to communities. And in particular, working with faith leaders and communities of faith to, bring, to raise that issue. Is it right or wrong? And one of the things in the Southeast that we face terribly is energy burdens. And the People's Justice Council has started a campaign that's called Energizing the South for Energy Justice. We just had a summit where we had over 100 faith leaders come together and, and uh, plan and strategize as well as be encouraged around energy justice. And what we, what we are calling for now is communities of faith to uh, bring together uh, ministries that will uh, look at weatherization as a ministry, look at energy efficiency as a ministry to help look out for the least and the left out. Thank you for my time. Thank you so much, Reverend Malcolm. Um, seems like there's always more meat to add. <laughs> I love it. We've got endless, or veggies, of course. I like to think of them as veggies, but um, okay, next up, um, we welcome Jose Agutu, Associate Director of the Catholic Climate Covenant. Um, 
it was such a joy to talk with you the other day and to hear about your work and the vast um, community of passionate people that you bring to this effort. And so I welcome you again and uh, look forward to your offering. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. Um, um, Reverend Rashenda, um, Reverend Malcolm and Todd, I'm, I'm looking for uh, tomatoes and cucumbers in the salad bowl. I don't think that you left any for me after <laughs> those great words. Um, um, and I also wanna preface my comments by saying that Todd and I first talked last week. Uh, we, the Catholic Climate Covenant are still discerning where we are in this space. Um, but I want to express where we are um, as an organization um, and, and move forward with that, um, if you don't mind. Um, so um, hold on a moment. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with St. Pope John Paul II's uh, message on the World Day of Peace on January 1st, 1990. We must go to the source of the problem and face in its entirety that profound moral crisis of which destruction of the environment is only one troubling aspect. Respect for life and above all for the dignity of the human person is the ultimate guiding norm for any sound economic, industrial or scientific pro progress. No peaceful society can afford to neglect either respect for life or the fact that there is an integration to creation. The earth and its atmosphere are telling us there is an order in the universe which must be respected and that the human person endowed with the capability of choosing freely has a grave responsibility to preserve this order for the well-being of future generations. I wish to repeat that the ecological crisis is a moral issue. And in this context, um, unquote, and in this context, where do we center and how do we organize? According to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops in 1991, as individuals, institutions, and people, we need a change of heart to preserve and protect the planet for our children and for the generations yet unborn. In 2001, they said at its core, global climate change is not about economic theory or political platforms, nor about partisan advantage or interest group pressures. It's about the future of God's creation and the one human family." Unquote. So we seek to engage in faith-filled and nonpartisan ways, both within the church and outside of it. And when front-facing towards political engagement, we seek bipartisan solutions first. And in contrast, we seek to dissipate the partisanship and to build bridges and seek reconciliation for the common good of all. And where does this emanate? As Reverend Malcolm said, from the greatest commandment in which Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes on to extend this plea to love of our enemies. As John Lewis so courageously showed us, this love and forgiveness is necessary to halt cycles of darkness and hatred. And as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In the realm of policy and legislation, I wish to broaden uh, my reach to include the incoming Biden administration and the business community. And so while the Biden administration rejoins the Paris Agreement, we ask that they not just participate, but lead and to increase prioritization of issues related to our poor and vulnerable neighbors on issues related to adaptation, loss and damage, financial support, technical transfer and collaboration. And on a larger scale to consider debt forgiveness by financial institutions. For the administration in Congress, we support the Kigali Amendment, which would phase down the use of hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants that would otherwise add as much as 0.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by 2050. We and other faith communities have always supported leadership and funding for the Green Climate Fund. In Congress, the USCCB in the past has supported a price on carbon, citing the Energy Innovation and Carbon, Din carbon, carbon Dividend Act. And I wish to note that a price on carbon is not only a market-based mechanism, 
but an economic, social, environmental, and human health mechanism based on the same premise for why we pay taxes so that society can take waste and contaminants out of our drinking water, clean up oil spills, and collect our trash. We would be interested in legislation that includes climate-related measures that also create jobs, especially for low-income and people of color communities and for people impacted um, by their industries. Finally, for business leaders, we hope that they will lean into and apply the values many are now discerning that go beyond the interests of shareholders in the next quarter and to orient towards the common good and our common home. For the word economy is based on the Greek word echo, which means house, and then economy as management of the house. Ideally then care for our common home and not per se or exclusively the care for money and self-interest. As Cardinal Turkson has said, the three objectives of business are to produce good goods, to provide good work, and to achieve good wealth. So let us all together in all of our separate sectors in the climate orchestra come together and weave a beautiful symphony. Thank you for your time. Oh, Jose, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I just am so thrilled to hear us start out in faith concepts and end up in legislation. This is like my world's colliding and I'm so excited. Um, in our opening session, we had Dimon from New Consensus and he started out with a story about Jesus and turned it into a conversation about the Federal Reserve in abundance. That was a pretty good linkage too. So this is very exciting. All right, I'll try not to comment in between. Um, next up, I'd like to welcome Roberto Mucaro Borero president of the United Confederation of Taino People. Roberto, it was also a joy to meet you. I don't know if you caught the opening session, but Clyde Hall was there and um, that was a real blessing, obviously. And uh, so I welcome you and thank you so much for being here. And uh, the floor is yours. Taigwe Ituno Kena Atiaono Diri Mukaro Aguibana Boriken Taino Daka I just wanted to give a quick greeting in my own uh, ancestral language, my indigenous language, my Taino language, and that language is not English or Spanish or any other colonial language. And I think that it's important uh, that I set the tone of, of what I'm gonna share a little bit on uh, at this time uh, with you in that way. I think that um, indigenous languages hold a lot of, uh, of our answers and our, and our solutions, our, our guiding principles, as, as you might think. And that's why it's important that we promote them and uh, share them as much as we can. Uh, we tried to do this early on in the, in the early contact period, but it seemed like uh, the colonists were always more, more interested in us learning their language than them understanding our language and our connection uh, to the world around us. So as you mentioned, uh, and, and I uh, stated in my um, introduction, uh, my name's uh, Roberto Borrero. In my community, I'm also uh, called Mucaro Aguebana, and I'm a Boriken Taino. I come from the, the Taino tribe of Wainia of, of Boriken, and uh, that's indigenous peoples of uh, what today is known as Puerto Rico. And why that's important is because uh, the Taino were uh, amongst the very first were the very first in this hemisphere to uh, meet Columbus in 1492. And that's where we see a lot of the, this, this early on, this, this kind of culture of, of, uh, of greed over need uh, kind of take root. And, and we still see the, the effects of that uh, kind of commodification of nature up until this day. I think it's also important to, to say that uh, as Taino people in Puerto Rico, uh, we're a very small um, uh, part of the overall population uh, demographically. And uh, I think that's that's can be said for indigenous peoples throughout uh, the US mainland as well. So it's important when we talk about indigenous peoples, just to set the context, you have uh, federally recognized tribes. That means uh, indigenous nations, peoples who have a nation to nation uh, relationship with the US government. You have state recognized tribes who have a relationship on the state level, but not at the federal level often. 
And then finally, you have a number of indigenous peoples, nations that are not currently recognized. So this is who I'm, I'm thinking about when I talk about indigenous peoples and in, indigenous engagement. So that would, of course, include, uh, when we talk about U.S. policy, the indigenous peoples who are uh, residing in what are now U.S. territories. And that would include uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, et cetera. So uh, with that in mind, uh, as far as uh, you mentioned, uh, the, the organization that I'm affiliated with, uh, the United Confederation of Taino People, we've been uh, pretty active on a national, international, and even a local level uh, on the issue of climate change and uh, trying to raise our voice and add our voice uh, to those who are trying to find solutions uh, to the climate crisis that we find ourselves in. And one of the things that we've been uh, really uh, focused on is the relationship and the need for people to really understand if we want to build the kind of coalition that you're talking about, Todd, is that climate change, racial justice, these things are intertwined. You know, for us, I'll give you a good example of, of what I mean by that. You know, what, uh, 1492, we go back to that time. Columbus comes, you know, we have a, a, a oppressive acts. We, we, we become colonized peoples. Right, within our own homelands. And uh, that, that continues on uh, up until uh, more recent times, uh, the Spanish-American uh, war and uh, so forth, where the U.S. now becomes uh, the, uh, the owner of, of that uh, colonized relationship or, or the, the main uh, facilitator of that. So when we're thinking about uh, the response, for example, uh, to Hurricane Maria and the other things that we've seen in Puerto Rico, we know that uh, a reason why there was so many deaths and so many people affected is not just because we are poor people, but we've become impoverished through a system and systems that seek to oppress us and that are racially based. And uh, why, why do I say that is because as you even move, so um, as you even move toward the mainland, we see that there's a, a relationship between that oppression, that racism, that also religious intolerance, which is good to talk about in, in, in this particular session, where, where that intolerance becomes codified in the US a Supreme Court decision, which kind of sets up a paternalistic uh, relationship between indigenous peoples uh, on the mainland and elsewhere and the US government. So moving forward, I think it's important for all of us to really understand that kind of relationship, understand that history. And I was very encouraged to hear uh, the land acknowledgement from several of our speakers acknowledging uh, where they are and the native peoples uh, whose lands they find themselves on. For example, I come from the island of Boriking, but I'm uh, right now talking to you from New York, from Seneca ter territory uh, in Long Island. And again, uh, another island uh, that, that also is uh, very susceptible to uh, the climate crisis. And we've seen that with, uh, Hurricane, with, with oh, Hurricane Sandy and, and elsewhere. So uh, that's, that's one thing where I wanted to set up. So I think that it's important for uh, organizations that are trying to pull together uh, coalitions that will make a, a real difference in legislation also consider really actively engaging indigenous peoples, whether that's at the local level where uh, people are, are around their, their particular territory, like the land acknowledgements, but also on these national discussions. And so, and it's not just, a, it shouldn't be just um, this idea of tokenizing uh, one organization above others. There are a lot of good organizations doing good work and that can really contribute uh, to the discussion. Oftentimes we get, and we contribute to them, of course, uh, because we want to be in solidarity and we want to uh, support this. Uh, we contribute to sign on letters, for example. We just signed on one that's calling for an executive order uh, for Joe Biden to acknowledge that, that climate crisis. There's another one that, that's focusing on ending subsidies uh, you know, for, for new uh, oil leases and, and companies uh, and things of that nature. But we want to be uh, looked upon not only as a signer, but also in a developer of that language, right? Because we have a particular perspective and a relationship with the earth that I think it's important for people to remember. And that would be helpful for all of us if we want to see a future for our present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Roberta. Yes, an open, inclusive, everyone in the conversation from the beginning. That's our vision as well. Um, thank you so much for all of that. Um, okay, uh, next we'd like to welcome 
Shanta Reddy Alonzo, Executive Director of Creation Justice Ministries. Um, welcome, Shanta, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really glad to be with all of you today. Uh, I am zooming in today from Indio, California, uh, the homelands of the Kawia people. And my organization, Creation Justice Ministries, is a collaboration, an ecumenical collaboration of dozens of Christian denominations, communions, and fellowships. Uh, we work at the national level to represent the creation, care, and environmental justice policies of our members. And through our members, we serve about 100,000 congregations and 35 million people. Um, Creation Justice Ministries is uh, really poised to um, take advantage of this unprecedented moment that we have before us. Uh, we know that the ecological crisis demands our attention and the incoming Biden-Harris administration has a uh, mandate uh, that we should not take for granted. We are entering a time unlike any other uh, time that we have experienced where not only is there a mandate to address the climate crisis, but there is a clear mandate to address environmental justice, and environmental racism. And so for organizations like mine that have been building for years, uh, the awareness and the political will and the opportunity uh, to make policies uh, that will change uh, the state of play, uh, the, the opportunity is, is huge right now. And I will just say that um, as we approach our climate justice strategy, uh, we have to be very aware that our country is in the middle of a great reckoning, reckoning with racism and no climate justice policy can move forward in this time without at the same time addressing systemic racism. And so our organization, Creation Justice Ministries, we have been looking at uh, what that means for us. And um, as Christians, this means we have a deep need to educate, equip, and mobilize our own communities to critically examine some of the deep ideological origins of um, theologies and laws that have justified over time uh, genocide, slavery, um, and erasure of uh, Black and Indigenous peoples in particular. Um, and this means examining the doctrine of Christian discovery, uh, which is the um, ideology of Columbus and um, much of the settler colonialism that was prevalent um, as our country's system for managing lands and waters and understanding property uh, was being set up. Um, as we look at policies that um, pursue climate justice, uh, we want to make sure that um, they are done they are executed in a way and by a government that looks like uh, the, the people into by administration to appoint people who look like the rest of the country. Uh, we are looking for a Biden-Harris administration to protect uh, historical, cultural, and spiritual heritage of a more diverse part of the country. Uh, we are looking for uh, policies that support the self-determination of Indigenous peoples and upholding Indigenous peoples' relationship to lands, waters, and species, um, and particularly um, to look at um, eco-reparations possibilities. So this may include land return to Indigenous peoples in places where, um, particularly in places where treaties have not been honored. Uh, it may involve co-management of public lands and waters uh, that respects the original caretakers of those places and the importance of their Indigenous wisdom. It includes material support for black farmers and support for black land stewardship. So I am very much looking forward to moving into a new era of climate justice policies and I'll uh, stop there and continue the conversation later. Thank you so much, Shanda. Um, I love this, this is great. All right, next I'd like to welcome Reverend Kyle Mayer Shop, um, who is with the Young Evan Evangelicals for Climate Action. Welcome, Kyle. It's so great to meet you, I, and uh, we look forward to giving you the stage here. Thank you, Todd. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here um, with all of the other faith leaders and all of the other participants today. Uh, I want to start by uh, honoring and offering gratitude to the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi people who stewarded the lands of Western Michigan for millennia, where I live and move and have my being. 
Uh, I work with an organization called Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. We are a network of young Christians across the country who are coming together and taking action to address the climate crisis as an expression of our Christian witness and discipleship. In other words, we do the work that we do precisely because we are people marked by the good news of Jesus, which is what evangelical actually means, and not in spite of it. Uh, and as I thought about what I wanted to share today, I got thinking about Bill Moyer's uh, four roles of the activist. Um, he says that there are four fundamental roles um, that activists fill to create change. Um, there are citizens, there are change agents, there are rebels, and there are reformers. I was thinking specifically about those two R's, rebel and reformer, and how the faith community is so uniquely positioned to fill those two roles, and in fact is already fulfilling those roles. I say that the faith community is equipped to do so because at least in my tradition, we have examples of people our ancestors in the faith who have filled those roles. We have rebels like the prophets throughout the Old Testament um, who were always critiquing institutions of power, uh, not because they were outsiders speaking to an institution that they had no connection to, but precisely because they were within the system and because uh, they loved the community that they were critiquing. Um, because of that love and because of their identity um, as members of that community, they then had the power to call it to account, to call out its hypocrisy, to call out the injustices that it was perpetrating. Uh, rebels are needed in this movement when we're talking about climate policy and how the faith community can drive climate policy. We need rebels protesting. We need rebels sitting in. We need rebels pushing the boundaries so that the Overton window continues to shift uh, as we all work toward big, audacious climate policy. We need the rebels to be doing their work because that's how we get to a place where a big climate plan, a big comprehensive climate plan is politically feasible. At the same time, we need those reformers. Reformers are people who work inside the system with the existing uh, distribution of power to create as much change as they can as quickly as possible. Uh, we need reformers like Daniel, like Joseph, uh, like King Josiah in the history of Israel who reformed the monarchy and brought Israel back um, to God's commands. There are examples of reformers throughout scriptural, the scriptural tradition, and my faith community, at least, is well-placed to see ourselves in that tradition as well. We need reformers who are working even now to make sure that a continuing resolution that funds the government or any stimulus bill that is passed is as robust as possible in providing clean, family-sustaining jobs. Um, and, and supporting clean energy programs and technologies. Um, we need those reformers building those relationships uh, and, and working those contacts so that even as we all push together toward big, audacious, comprehensive policy, we are also chipping away at the edifice of climate inaction right now, here and now. YECA really straddles both. My organization really straddles both. We protest at the people's climate marches. We march in the streets. We strike for our futures. We also build relationships with members of Congress across the political spectrum and across the ideological aisle. We have meetings with Republican members of Congress um, to help them understand that young evangelicals especially take this really seriously and to help them understand that many of them were sent to Congress uh, with the support of evangelical voters. Uh, and if they want to continue to enjoy that support, they need to start paying attention to what the next generation of evangelicals is saying is important to them. And that is racial justice. That is climate justice. That is immigrant and refugee rights. Um, so uh, I'm excited to, to be a part of this conversation. I'm excited to to talk about 
um, how we can mobilize the faith community to fulfill both of those roles, uh, the reformer and the rebel, um, because it's both roles are our heritage and, and both roles are our inheritance and our calling. Oh, thank you so much. It almost has me a little teary eyed seeing that this cause is made this, that we're in, this situation that we're in might be the catalyst for humanity to really unite across all of our different belief systems and histories. And, you know, it's just touching me that I see this manifesting and it's so beautiful. Um, all right, uh, next up we have Nigel Savage, president and CEO of Hazan. Welcome, Nigel. I'm so glad you're here with us and we look forward to your offering. You're muted, Nigel. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Um, I'm incredibly uh, honored to be here and to be with everybody. I come to you live from an island which 500 years ago was lived upon by the Lenape people and is today better known as the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, I, I, Kazan is the largest environmental organization in the Jewish community. And I want to talk really just a little bit about the Jewish community in relationship to all of this. Um, I want to say straightforwardly, almost every single thing that has been said, I have, I personally agree with, I think Kazan agrees with, and truthfully, three quarters of the Jewish community voted for Biden-Harris in the last election, and I think a majority of American Jews agree with. But I think I want to talk a little bit about process um, and calendars. Um, and I also just want to note, Rishenda, that you began by talking about hope. And if we get a, a second go around, I want to note that while we are in this session, the Jewish festival of Hanukkah is going to begin. It's going to start in about an hour's time. And Hanukkah is ultimately about hope. And I literally can't think of a better place to be than with all of you in this session right now to celebrate the start of Hanukkah. I want to say very straightforwardly that this has been a year in which the organized Jewish community has had almost zero capacity to address these issues. It's been a year, as we all know, of crisis and reacting and pivoting. For synagogues, it was, how are we going to meet? And how are we going to do high holy services? For Jewish day schools, it was like, we're going to meet. Are the kids coming in? What are we doing? Jewish community centers were closed. In general, amidst that, the capacity of the organized Jewish community, just to be really honest, to address uh, climate crisis in a really serious way has been, has been somewhat limited. I believe that we're really going to catapult into 2021. 2021 is the start of a new calendar year. It's the start of a new fiscal year. January 20th is the inauguration and it'll be the first time in US history we will have a president, it seems, talk in a really serious way about the climate. As we have talked about a collective comprehensive bill, one would hope whether it's called the Green New Deal or not, that there will be reference to that in the inaugural speech. For the Jewish community a week later, it's Tu B'Shvat, the new year for trees. On April 22nd, it's Earth Day, and sound the call within Earth Day is a moment for faith communities to come together. And then this coming Jewish New Year in September is in the Jewish calendar, the sabbatical year, the Shemitah year, which is about land inequality, debt, and debt relief. And November is going to be COP26 in Glasgow in Scotland, delayed for a year, in which the world's religions are going to be asked to develop seven-year plans. And so fundamentally, we're going into 2021 saying across the Jewish community, quoting a very famous line from the Talmud 2000 years ago, we're not required to complete the task, but neither can we desist from it. What happens in the next 10 years won't change the next 10 years. The extreme weather events that happen in the next 10 years are the consequence of what we've done in the last 100 and the changes we haven't made in the last 40. But what happens in the next 10 years is going to be immensely consequential for the rest of this century, for all of our kids and our grandkids. And so we're really saying two things. To individuals in the Jewish community, commit to three things. Number one, make some further change in your own behavior. Not that it's enough by itself, but it's what's the minimum required 
to look ourselves in the mirror or the next generation. Number two, give time and money to organizations that are working to address these issues. And number three, raise your voice, both in terms of public political advocacy, but also within any institution of which you are part. And that leads to the second thing, because to Jewish institutions, we're saying, you should be using this next year or two to start to flesh out a seven-year vision for your institution. Certainly within the Jewish community, but I think that we would say to all of us, from all of us, over the next decade, we have to flesh out an integrated vision for faith communities. We have to address education and action and advocacy. We have to look at the power we use, the food we serve, the plastic in our institutions, the education we deliver, interfaith, the farm bill, food justice, racial justice, food sovereignty, the whole shebang. And because people have limited time and limited attention, we're saying you don't have to complete that now, but you cannot, as of this next new year, desist from beginning it. So that's why I'm incredibly honored, both personally, professionally, and as CEO of Chazan to be here. I think the Jewish community, a whole raft of organizations and institutions, we want to put our shoulder to the wheel. And I think, Todd, what you said just now, that, that this is an opportunity for faith communities to come together across difference with a single vision of a better America and a better world for everybody. That's what this is about. Thank you. Hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you so much, Nigel. <laughs> what a blessing this is. Um, and next, okay, we have Reverend Fletcher Harper. And Reverend, uh, I can't believe we've never sp spoken or met directly because you were my, one of my first outreach and you got me into the People's Climate Movement work. And that's where I met this whole community. And um, it's just an honor to uh, finally have this all come together at this point. And uh, so I'm very excited to hear what you have to say and it's a pleasure. Welcome. Thanks so much, Todd. And thank you for doing all the work to bring us all together. It's not a small thing these days to get hundreds of people to show up willingly on a Zoom call. So kudos to, kudos to you and, and many thanks. So um, in an effort to build on what's been said, um, from an interfaith perspective, I'm Christian. Green Faith is an international interfaith organization. And we see at the level of, of religious and spiritual and moral values, themes of compassion and of love and of justice described differently in different traditions with their different vocabularies. Uh, but those would be words that I'd use to say, what are the themes that underlie religious responses globally around <clears throat> climate change? And I think it's also important to be very clear about what are the root causes that we're up against. And again, on a, on a global scale, we see a combination of either ineffective or increasingly authoritarian or corrupt governments being one part of the problem. We see extractive industries, which to be frank, have no serious intention at this point in changing the way in which they're operating. Um, the third piece of the picture that we see, which doesn't get talked about that much, but which I think religious communities have to talk about is the fact that there are on a global scale extremist cultural and religious forces which are a huge part of the threat to the climate and which exercise considerable cultural, political and economic power. In Brazil, for example, which just yesterday had the gall through with the Bolsonaro regime to come out with a a uh, climate commitment towards the COP that's actually worse than the past one. Um, it's widely recognized that the government is controlled by neo-Pentecostal and fundamentalist Christian interests. Uh, we know the power of these interests in the US in 
India, we see the power of Hindu nationalism on the rise. And there is a clear overlap between cultural and religious extremism, cultural intolerance, religious and racial intolerance, and extractive industries. And so I think at a root cause, we need to be able to think in, in those kinds of ways and analyze the problems through those lenses. When it comes to the US and the, the Biden administration, I think we have to be very careful of climate happy talk. Clearly Biden will be better than what's just been experienced, but equally clearly that's a abysmally low bar. Mm -hmm. And as religious people, we, we just cannot forget that we have almost lost the ability now to meet the two degree threshold, let alone 1.5 degrees. We, we are very, very much sort of 80%, 90% of the way over the cliff. And so I think we have to come with a pretty uncompromising attitude and vibe towards what's going on. So on a, on a specific level, what that means is that we have to be uh, clear that it is no longer acceptable for there to be any new fossil fuel infrastructure or any further expansion of industrial agriculture. And that those industries must enter into a managed decline with clear and measurable targets. We need to be very clear that there has to be, as Roberto said, a, an immediate end to subsidies for oil and gas exploration. Um, there certainly needs to be an end to the idea that the fossil fuel sector gets subsidies to explore for new oil and gas, and then similarly subsidies to experiment with mechanisms for putting the emissions that they've created back underground. And that's underway. And I guarantee you that even if there's a 50-50 split in the Senate, Republican interests are gonna come out very strong for in support of climate engineering as a technological solution. And I think religious communities need fundamentally to reject that. Um, we need to be very clear that there needs to be pressure on banks and on financial institutions to cut out lending to enable the creation of new fossil fuel, industrial agriculture interests. That's gotta stop. And if people are sort of in their minds saying this is impossible, I'd like to remind everybody that yesterday the New York State Pension Fund announced that it was gonna divest from fossil fuels. And those of us who've been involved in that fight are very accustomed to hearing that something's impossible and then blowing that out of the water. I think uh, on the positive side of the equation, we have to be ready to push the administration to commit to net zero emissions within a decade. That's what the science requires. And it's not our job as religious leaders to be concerned about political expedience. It just isn't. Show me somewhere in any of our sacred texts where it says thou shalt be politically expedient. It's just not there. Um, and I think that as part of that, you know, Kyle spoke really well about the prophetic voice. Prophetic voices are unafraid of what the status quo says. And we need to summon that spirit and that attitude as we go at this, if we're serious about climate justice. Um, on the positive side, we need to see a massive investment. And this is true ever more so during COVID in a just transition for workers and impacted communities including healthcare maintenance, income maintenance, job retraining, job placement. And that needs to be done with a particular racial justice lens because we know that in the past, when those types of programs have come in, that racial discrimination has been a, a devastatingly negative part of those efforts. So we need to do the just transition and we need to do it well. We need to be ready in this country to welcome generously a large number of migrants who are coming because of the climate emergency. And we need to make it possible because right now no politician will talk about that. We need to make it possible to talk about that. And I think in, in closing, um, in addition, Robert and, and Shanta talked 
very well about commitments to upholding indigenous rights. Um, I think that religious leaders need to be ready to challenge the intellectual grasp that capitalism has on our imaginations about political economy, because that will scare people in a way that they need to be scared. We need to reckon with an economic system that's brought the world to the verge of collapse and find a better way. Around the world on March 11th, religious, diverse religious and spiritual communities are, are coming together around these and other demands with a, a global multi-faith day of action called Sacred People, Sacred Earth. And you can Google that web, uh, that URL, and it'll, it'll come up. And we're really glad to be working with partners from about 15 or 20 different countries so that we in the US can ask for re-entry back into the global table and be part of a really powerful moral religious coalition around the world that, that makes this kind of blessed future happen. So many thanks. Oh, my goodness, this is, thank you so much. Reverend Fletcher, that was just amazing. Um, <laughs> so um, it's just so rich. It's uh, so all right. We'll go back around now and um, in the round robin fashion, and we'll dig in a little bit deeper. Um, so uh, part of what we've been doing uh, with our grassroots network is organizing by congressional district and um, around a package of climate bills that touch on many of these things that have been written by uh, the various coalitions, plastic, fracking, regenerative farming, ending the CAFOs, pesticide bill. Um, there's a whole suite of them and there are bills on international force. There's a bill that's pending to ban banks from financing infrastructure that's coming on the pipeline. Um, there's a whole suite of bills that are popping up all over now and there's more in Congress. And, so we've collected those bills and gone through a community process of discussing and embracing them as a package. And we're using that as a prototype really to then now have people adopt their congressional district. Um, so local organizations are adopting their congressional district and it's local climate reality chapter or 350 chapter, Sierra Club, Unitarian Universalists. Um, and then they're organizing many coalitions around the package and going and lobbying already. So it's sort of a beta example, proof of concept of how we could organize cross sector um, across issues with existing legislation to start to weave together the, the networks and the communities that we're talking about on a local level. So I just put that out there um, as a concept for us to keep in mind that we're pivoting the question to how are we gonna merge our efforts? and how we're gonna unite and, and act as one so that we're all lobbying on the same day and we're all marching on the same day. Um, maybe not lobbying and marching for the same things, but that's okay. So we're, how are we gonna stitch ourselves together on the ground in district and tie our vast networks together? And then uh, how are we gonna act in a collaborative way? Um, so I'll just set the stage with that and I'll just invite Reverend Malcolm to tell us about your you know, nuts and bolts organizing and the network of Interfaith Power and Light that you're with and, you know, take it from there. So yeah, uh, with Interfaith Power and Light, uh, there are a few things that we do. One, we have some central programs that we all uh, pretty much push the same, uh, but we've also got uh, state legislative days uh, where we, we actually go to uh, do advocacy together collectively. And uh, we, we do that not just in our various states, but we also do it uh, not, uh, on a federal level as well. And, and so we do have that collectively as IPL. Uh, the People's Justice Council, um, our goal hadn't been necessarily to uh, go to the state houses yet because we understand that it's deeper than that. The first thing we've got to do is get people to recognize that there are those that suffer and understand that they are, they are suffering and to label them as such, as the suffering. Uh, and so I, in that, I, I wrestle with uh, how do we approach uh, this legislation when I know that my folk 
uh, still being killed in the street by those who have been sworn to protect and serve. We, we've got to first get people to see that there are those that suffer. We've labeled them as thugs. We've labeled them as welfare queens. We've labeled them as, as uh, uh, everything else except for those that suffer. And so my goal is to see, uh, to get people to see that they are though there are those that suffer and that that is something that we can do about it. And we use legislation to push for protections for our people. So I, my approach is a bit different is what I'm trying to get to Todd, I apologize. No, it's all good. But uh, so we're not gonna, well, we, I won't do follow up questions like this all the time, but that's okay. You are you involved in any legislative tables in the in like what's the lay of the land that yes you're... Uh, okay so me personally <laughs> I'm sorry I thought you were you wanted me to talk about interfaith power and light and and uh, people's justice council so me personally and representing the people's justice council with us can I am the international liaison that uh, deals with the uh, international policies uh, but I also sit at the five tables which is a consortium of the five large uh, green organizations uh, that make decisions uh, or have communications based on uh, legislation, uh, as well as the kitchen cabinet, which, which deals more with international policy, but we're starting to really look at domestic policy as well. And so, yes, I do, uh, sit in those in those realms, and I think it's important that faith leaders are at, at those tables because we bring that that uh, moral uh, consciousness to the to the uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Sorry for not answering that. No, that's wonderful. And so, on session two, we had Greenpeace and and 350 and Sierra Club. The you know the executive directors and presidents of those groups came together and they talked about the tables a little bit, and I talked to them about the. Um, comprehensive immigration reform movement, which has a national coalition by the US, led by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and the ACLU, and then a, a network tied to state coalitions. And the New York Immigration Coalition, for example, has 200 members and 36 staff members, um, just for the New York Coalition. And obviously, comprehensive immigration reform is priority day one for uh, Representative Biden. And that's not an accident. That's because of that organizing framework, that national framework. And the, um, the, the green groups were very receptive to the idea of coming up with a macro, more public facing, more transparent, and then a process for a more inclusive conversation about a comprehensive bill. So I'm very excited about that. But so if you're in those circles, then we can start to coordinate because this is how we're gonna bring the grassroots and the tops and align this all the way through. So this is extremely important. And I was really excited to hear the receptivity uh, to this new, to expanding what exists, formalizing it, and um, opening it. Well, Ty, you know, uh, there's a saying where I grew up in East Atlanta. Uh, we say we down like four flat ties, which simply means that we, we me and you in this together. So you know, you've got my my back, and I know I've I mean I know I've got your back, and I know you've got mine. Let's work together and make it happen, like we've been doing. That means the world to me. Um, thank you, uh, Jose. Welcome. And uh, yes, I know I didn't mean to overstate the how far our relationship had gone since last week. What I was really referring to is your vast uh, capacity. And so it's not necessarily bringing everybody into. We're not even sure what the next phase of all this is. We're going to hopefully come together on January 13th at noon. We put a place marker to discuss what uh, uh, you know next steps. Um, but it's your capacity and the reach that you described to me and the fact that you're in this to win it. So if you could describe a little bit more about your, you know, the capacity of your community and um, then what role you're playing in legislative drafting or what process you wish there were maybe for a more inclusive approach to uh, drafting something comprehensive. So uh, first to start with saying that we have just been presented with this space and so we can't make any commitments to it as of yet, although obviously your, your tactics and, and your convergence are exceptionally intriguing, you know. Um, 
it's complicated. <laughs> I'm just going to, so I'm just going to give you some numbers on the U.S. Catholic Church writ large, and then we'll, we'll hopefully find something at the bottom of that list. Um, 700, 70 million U.S. Catholics, 193 active dioceses, 17,000 parishes, over 6,000 parochial schools, 200 and over 260 Catholic colleges and universities, many Catholic health systems, hundreds of religious orders, thousands of, of Catholic NGOs. And as we know, Catholics span the spectrum, they span the political spectrum. Uh, and there is also a, an architecture within the church being a hierarchical church where in the United States, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops is the lead representative institution. So in order to manifest or move this overall structure, it's best to work with the US Conference of Catholic Bishops at least at first to, to bring this to bear. And so we have to fundamentally have this into our consideration as well as the panoply the vast diversity of opinions that the US Catholic Church writ large has on these issues. Um, so we, for example, the Adorers of the Blood of Christ, uh, a, a, a sister's order standing in front of a pipeline in Pennsylvania, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, and then, you know, you have uh, other Catholics on the other side of the spectrum. Um, so in, in that, obviously it's, too complicated to get into the dynamics in the space. But what I would say with regard to the Catholic Climate Covenant, we do have tens of thousands of constituents who will write emails and sign petitions and some will be willing to go to offices. And we wanna work on an interfaith basis as we have done in the past to manifest some of that lobbying presence um, uh, upon approved upon legislative priorities. Um, so I, I just wanna give you our, our, our capability there. And also that we, collaborate with other um, faith institutions um, and particularly Catholic institutions who want to be more active and encourage their participation. So I'll just leave that placeholder for you. Thanks. Wonderful. That's just exciting. You, all these other sessions, you should hear the capacity that people are expressing. And so my dream and hope is that we're going to merge all of our capacities and then no one will be able to tell us no. And if we have that scientifically based dream goal that's that's infused with all the justice issues that we're talking about, and it maybe takes us a year to pull that together, but we might have time with a block Senate and we spend a year building super infrastructure. Um, and then we turn our attention to electoral politics a little bit in the next election, in the midterms, that by the third year of this administration, we might be in a very different position with respect to making major things happen. So it's just the capacity that I see in this movement is blows my mind. And not only that, but the passion. And so the trick is to organize the organizers, to unite us in common cause and through some formal framework and, and infrastructure so that we're you know speaking and acting as one. Um, so uh, I welcome, uh, Shanta, into the conversation, and I know you're on many tables. Um, please, you know, share whatever you'd like about this journey of coming together with other groups and drafting legislation. And what what do you see as, from your experience, the pathway forward, perhaps? And what are the opportunities for macro coalition building? And anything you'd like to share on those themes? Sure. So Creation Justice Ministries is a member of many uh, places where innovative policy visioning uh, is happening, as well as uh, nitty gritty collaborations and strategies behind the scenes. Uh, so we are members of the U.S. Climate Action Network, uh, which has put forth a vision for equitable climate action, the VICA. Uh, we are part of the Next 100 Coalition for Equity on Public Lands and Waters, uh, which is very much interested in the role of um, the Department of Interior in um, making sure that the way that we go about doing um, our, the way we address the climate as well as nature crisis uh, is one that is done with equity and justice. 
Uh, and then we are uh, regularly part of the Washington Interreligious Staff Communities Energy and Ecology Working Group, which meets twice a month uh, and convenes faith-based organizations that have a presence on Capitol Hill. And in all of those spaces, uh, we are interacting with um, coalition partners that we um, have presence with on Capitol Hill uh, and with um, the administration. Um, and in all of these spaces, uh, we really do share some um, core priorities, uh, but the ecumenical climate policy priorities that um, Creation Justice Ministries leans on, and, and these were crafted by our, our board uh, about 10 years ago, and they still ring pretty true, um, are four, four principles, uh, stewardship, sustainability, sufficiency, and justice. Um, with those four principles, we evaluate any climate policy that we, we come across. And um, in all of these different spaces where we play, uh, we, we use that as a, as a measuring stick. And, and, and how do you see, so I think it's wonderful that all these tables exist or circles, organized circles. From a new, as a newcomer to this movement, I found it very difficult to ascertain what the background uh, machine is. And the, like I was talking about the immigration movement, there was a forward facing coalition that had a uh, website and you could figure out how to join in. And they had a bill already they, they had drafted. So do you see potential in formalizing these things? They're very sort of informally, they're not formally staffed. It's like the staff from the indiv individual organizations pulled together. What do you see is about the infrastructure potential to formalize these things, bring them forward, fully staff them um, and to make them more publicly transparent? Well, I mean, the US Climate Action Network is, is pretty organized. Um, it's a very strong hub of organizations that are working together um, and we're, you know, we're proud to be part of it. And it's also plugged into a global network of other climate action networks around the world. And we use that infrastructure to communicate with others about our, our global climate goals. Uh, so that's the most formal space uh, that we are part of. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of religious communities and the way that, you know, the infrastructure that we use to um, work together, uh, you know, we, um, we will meet the moment with the structure that is required. Um, sometimes structure can stifle movement, uh, but we have shown different instances where faith communities have worked together really productively. Like I'm remembering really fondly the way that uh, we worked together with uh, Green Faith and putting together the People's Climate March um, and the faith, the faith part of that march. And um, as the moment arises, we'll build the structure that's necessary. But those relationships um, are longstanding behind the scenes. Wonderful, thank you. And Roberto, um, apologies, I skipped you in the order because I moved them around. Um, Roberto, you and I talked about the fact that you, you know, your communities have been instrumental in the Paris work, the international work. Um, and I think if I recall correctly, when we were talking, um, you, you said you, you had not been invited as much to the legislative drafting tables and to that stage of development. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that and how to create a more inclusive um, process for, from the beginning for drafting you know, whatever we can possibly pull together. Well, thank you very much, Todd. And uh, I really enjoyed hearing everybody's uh, comments so far. I think for um, an organization uh, like the one I work with, United Confederation of Taino People, which is a it's just smaller, understaffed, uh, more grassroots coalition of, of indigenous peoples, uh, it's important to link up with other uh, indigenous peoples networks. Uh, for example, uh, we worked very closely and we we're an affiliate of the International Indian Treaty Council. Uh, that's how we were able to engage uh, to the level that we, we did in the Paris uh, climate talks. And uh, as, you, as you said, you know, we were very active uh, with other indigenous peoples, with the negotiating group to really push uh, for the, the term and the concept of rights uh, right, in, right in that document. So, you know, you find that the indigenous rights, indigenous rights of indigenous peoples in the preamble, which we feel sets the tone uh, for the rest of the document. And so, uh, you know, being part of that process is, is uh, important. 
because coming from smaller communities, contributing at that level, and actually seeing uh, something materialize in, as an international standard is, is empowering for indigenous peoples. And it, it really adds to the, the idea that you know, people can make a difference if they get involved. So it's it's uh, really important for us to be part of that. You know, more locally, uh, we have a big presence in, in the New York area besides uh, what we do in the islands. And uh, you, uh, Reverend Fletcher uh, mentioned uh, the New York Pension Fund uh, di um, divesting from fossil fuels. You know, we were a part of that discussion like other uh, indigenous peoples organizations in the New York area, American Indian Community House, um, indigenous nations like the Ramapo Lenape, all participated in that process. And so we're really very happy to see that come to fruition. So again, it's like, we have to think as, as grassroots people that, uh, you know, we act local, you know, we, we uh, also engage uh, nationally, but we also have to have our voice uh, intertwined internationally as well. So it's not just a, a, like a one size fits all solution. But uh, as you did mention, uh, I, di I do find oftentimes that, you know, many people talk about um, indigenous peoples and the need to elevate our voice because as original caretakers, you know, we've, we've, we've held these original instructions about relationship with the earth and, and reciprocity. Uh, since time immemorial. And now other folks are, are starting to use that terminology. Uh, they're starting to understand uh, the actual relationship to the earth. So you see it coming up more and more in, in people's statements and in the way that they present themselves, the idea of land acknowledgement, but it has to go further than that. There has to be a more active outreach uh, to indigenous peoples. And I, I think I mentioned in, in my previous comments, we can't just rely on one or two indigenous organizations to really speak uh, for indigenous peoples. There are many indigenous nations, as I mentioned, that have a federal relationship. So that that uh, entails engaging with, with tribal leadership, uh, you know, who are at the head of that governance. It's also engaging with community members and the grassroots organizations that sometimes are, you know, may have a disagreement with, with a tribal leadership. Uh, but you know, these voices need to be heard, people need to be engaged. So uh, I think that there's a real um, understanding of that need, at least for some people right now, if you take, for example, what happened uh, in, this, in this past election, you know, some of those swing states, Nevada, Arizona, Wisconsin, you know, people talked about other communities coming out in force, but oftentimes uh, you, the indigenous peoples where those those particular states have large indigenous uh, uh, populations within the demographics there, they're often invisible. And the, the outreach, the organizational capacity and everything that they did to help turn this election uh, to the point where we are now was really overlooked. So much so to the fact that CNN, uh, when they were talking about Arizona, posted a graphic of uh, the turnout of different ethnic uh, communities. So you had white, black, Latino, Asian um, mentioned, but then there was a category that said something else at 6%. And, and of course, you know, Arizona has, has quite a number of federally recognized indigenous nations within that state. And they really did a big uh, push to turn out um, people to participate uh, in the election process, but yet, uh, they were categorized as something else. And that I would also include Pacific Islanders in that. Uh, and, and so, you know, we really need to take that, that into, into account. The, the other thing that, that I wanted to say, and I'm, perhaps I'll wrap up here is that, you know, we're really interested in, in a few issues really that, that uh, besides the overall climate justice, you know, 1.5, 1, 1. We, we remember of course, the, the call of Pacific uh, islanders who say that that's 1.5 to, to stay alive, but look at what's happened at the in, uh, in the inaction uh, of of government and administration to where we are now, and the and the statistics that that you mentioned a, a little while ago. So we're really looking and and uh, trying to reinforce that idea of that rejection of fossil fuel projects. You know, we're talking about KXL pipeline. There's there's uh, line three that that's happening now all of these things are really important and i think that you know in the national organizing people really have to be uh, faith organizations and everyone else has to be really 
cognizant of, of those fights, of what's important to indigenous peoples, especially if we're talking about uh, you know, terminology and reconciling with the earth, right? In this, in this very spiritual manner, uh, which is, uh, you know, part of the reason that this particular uh, panel has, has convened that, uh, you know, there's a debt to be paid to indigenous peoples. We tried to tell folks in the very beginning, you know, what, what, kind, what this kind of a movement in a way being far away from the earth would do. And we're really seeing the, the consequences of that now. Thanks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, well, mm -hmm. great. I just um, in pulling this together, my observations of the climate movement writ large is that um, we have a lot of an informal uh, set. Todd, you you put yourself on mute somehow. Oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Roberto. Um, I was just gonna keep framing this conversation a little bit um, and pulling this and posing together in my perspective coming into this movement is that there are a lot of ad hoc institutions and we, we come together randomly for big marches and then we dissolve. Um, there are informal tables, they're not formalized, they're not staffed. So we have an infrastructure issue uh, that, so the status quo has not worked, right? Um, so far, but yet this huge capacity is there and everybody's doing their best so how do we formalize this so it's not ad hoc, so that there's a process for constant communication that's, that requires its own staffing, really? Um, because everyone is busy in their own jobs and job description and roles, and it's already you know, adding a lot to coordinate. Um, but there's a whole much more work that needs to happen that would be accomplished if there were a national coalition focused specifically on passing federal legislation. And we've joined US CAN as well. And I went to a couple of meetings, so I don't know much about them yet. And it looks like a lovely assembly. I, I wasn't clear on if, if really their mission is to compile and pass legislation. So that's what I, we have that with Freedom for America for the Equality Act, uh, Reform Immigration for America was for that bill. These, these, these examples exist. And so I'm still uh, eager to hear. And what does exist in my experience is not necessarily uh, open and inclusive. So there are private meetings and it's invite only. How do we flip that script, at least in a new incarnation that allows all these other things to continue to do their thing the way they want, but then also brings us together and invites everyone to the table. So with that framing, we'll move to the next, um, I don't know, uh, I'm sorry, Roberto, you went, but I took you out of order, Shanta went. So that's, Kyle, you're up. And if you could talk a little bit, Kyle, about, you know, are you invited to the legislative drafting tables? And what do you see as the infrastructure challenges? Um, I think, you know, younger voices, they come into this scene, this situation, and they're like, this is a morass of confusion. Um, how are we going to, you know, formalize this so we can have clarity that, you know, there's an onboarding system for new groups and make sure that there's a process for, you know, you know what I'm saying. So please take it away. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Todd. Well, I, I think the question that you asked is the million dollar question, right? Is, is how do we herd this group of cats that is the climate movement in one direction? It's, it is so big. It's so diverse. Um, and it, it, it strikes me that one of the reasons it hasn't um, been more consolidated in the past is that there are so many sticking points. Uh, there is significant uh, historical pain and trauma perpetrated within the movement um, amongst various members of the movement. There are dramatically different policy preferences and political ideologies represented. Um, that was something when I joined the, the climate movement about 10 years ago now, um, that was something that surprised me and that I've, I've kind of been initiated into is, is all of the history that I'm drinking downstream from um, when it comes to broken relationships um, and, and failed partnerships and just a diversity of policy preferences and opinions um, and, and how difficult the, the work of repairing that is. I, it strikes me that especially as people of faith, one of the gifts that we can bring to the climate movement is um, 
a gift for healing, a, a gift for um, reconciling relationships, for pursuing right relationships. Um, I'm a big believer in the power of relationship. And I think one of the problems with the climate movement is we are so disconnected from each other. It's one of the reasons I've loved being a part of US Climate Action Network um, as so many others on this call are because it centers relationship. Uh, and, and some of the closest relationships I have in the movement have come as a result of participating in the, the US Climate Action Network. Um, so I, I think pursuing right relationship together is critical, and, and that's not easy. Um, that's not going to happen overnight because that's going to require truth telling. That's going to require repentance from some people. Uh, it's going to require forgiveness from others. It's going to require um, turning in a new direction together. It's going to require transparency and accountability. Um, but I, I really think that it's the only way that a, a climate movement that is as big, diverse, and in many ways fractured as our current movement is, can actually come together. And I, I hope it's something that faith communities can lead the way on. Um, to to your, your other question, um, we don't often do the work of writing policy. Um, and one of the reasons is similar to Jose's, uh, our work is complicated. <laughs> um, we, we have a similarly large audience uh, because evangelical is um, a loosely defined term. It, it is difficult to get exact numbers, but it's somewhere uh, in the ballpark of 80 to 100 million Americans are evangelicals, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of denominations, tens of thousands of congregations across the U.S., and also like the Catholic community, politically diverse. Um, white evangelicals get a lot of press for their conservative ideology. A full third of the evangelical community in the US are black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and to, to make matters more complicated, we don't have the organizing structure, the, or, the hierarchy that exists in the Catholic church. Um, so, similar numbers of people we're trying to reach with similar uh, diversity of opinions and experiences without um, even a, an office like the U.S. Catholic, um, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to kind of organize things. Uh, so it, it requires us to be nimble in the policy work that we do. Um, we also have a set of policy principles like creation justice ministries that kind of are our North Star for our policy engagement. We need to see policy that's equitable, that's just that's bold, that's transformative, that's reasonable, which is to say based in objective evidence-based science and achievable with actual metrics. Um, transparent is another way to say it. We're also interested in, in building bipartisan coalitions, not only because we think that is the quickest way to uh, climate policy, but also because we believe that is going to create the most durable policy outcomes that will be insulated from the pendulum swing of of um, who, whichever political party is in or out of office. Um, so we, we, uh, we do policy work. Um, it is not a priority of ours. Much of our work uh, is continuing to try to build our um, community of evangelicals who can see themselves in the movement. So many people in our community don't consider the climate movement a natural fit for them. They don't see a lot of people like them that are in the movement. They don't hear the movement speaking their language most of the time. Uh, so a lot of what we try to do is help our community understand that their existing values call them into this movement um, and that this movement is diverse enough for them to be a part of it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think the work of trying to flatten uh, difference out of the movement um, it might not be uh, uh, the best strategy. I think our diversity and our difference is our strength. We just have to find a way to uh, harness it all and, and move it in more or less the right direction. Mm -hmm. And is the national, I worked with the immigration movement for a couple of years on that bill, mm -hmm. and that was quite a coalition. Um, and I, did I mention already that bill's moving? So that's a great opportunity for all of us to show of solidarity uh, by putting some skin in that game, get that bill passed, and then we'll have more available uh, partners once that lift is accomplished. Um, but the National Association of Evangelicals was in that uh, room, in that coalition, 
And so are you related to that group or how does that work? Yeah, we are very closely related to the National Association of Evangelicals. They're very strong partners of ours. Uh, the, the National Association of Evangelicals is the closest thing we have to an organizing entity within the evangelical church. They represent about 40, 44 million evangelicals. Um, about 40 or so denominations are a part of it. Uh, so yes, there is certainly that organizing structure. Um, it has less power uh, at the grassroots level or, or less authority at the grassroots level than say the, the Catholic hierarchy um, mm -hmm. has. Uh, frankly, many people don't know what the National Association of Evangelicals is. If you're a member of a non-denominational church somewhere in Missouri, um, it's very likely you've never heard of the NAE. Um, that doesn't mean the NAE isn't important. They do incredible work and we're, we're very grateful for them. We, we do work closely with them. Um, and they are very, very active on creation care and climate issues in large part um, because of the work that we have been able to do in relationship with them to move them in that direction. So I imagine they have some DC staff and some legislative folks. So maybe we could invite them to the, the conversation about a comprehensive climate bill. It'd be a great idea. Galen Carey uh, is their governmental affairs uh, person. He'd be terrific. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're going to weave all of us together somehow. That's the mission. Unity, a plan for unity is really the message I'm trying to convey. We need a plan for unity like we have a plan for everything else and get, you know, methodical about uh, pulling these things together. The ad hoc is not uh, uniting our political power. And that's why we have millions of people and thousands of organizations, but yet we still don't have a, you know, enough votes to even get any of the bills over a hundred co-sponsors so far. Um, so it's all hypothetical until you have the political power based on the real demand. Um, let's see, five, six. Nigel, um, welcome back and happy Hanukkah. <laughs> um, how exciting. I forgot it was even December. I'm so busy. I was like, how could that be? Is it, oh, that's right. This is December, isn't it? Um, I knew that. Um, so uh, I guess, again, the same question. I mean, whatever your internal capacity would be interesting. I think you may have mentioned some of that already, but how do you see the, you know, the formal infrastructure of, and how can we bring everyone together and within the infrastructure that does exist, how can we make it more transparent? And, and at least so that if you have insular tables, do you periodically report out? Do you periodically have open meetings like this one where you invite people to just come brief the public? You know, how do you, and how do we gonna interface better so that we can bring everybody into the party? So, um, so yes, uh, a couple of things. I think really in two different uh, directions. But one is somebody earlier on, and I'm not sure if it was you or somebody else talked about organizing the organizers. And I just wanna thank you just in this alone, like things like this, people don't see how much work goes into this behind the scenes. And this process of organizing the organizers is actually incredibly important. And I would certainly say that it's interesting for Khazan because in relationship to the interface space, I think that we genuinely see ourselves as junior and modest and wanting to follow and not lead. And I think that we really genuinely see our job as being trying to help the American Jewish community play its part in wider coalitions. Um, in terms of inside the Jewish community, you know, there's the famous line, two Jews, three opinions. Uh, <laughs> in our area, it's also muted into two Jews, three organizations. So, so, so just in our space, we have COJUL, the Coalition on the Environment and Jewish Life. We have JCAN, Jewish Climate Action Network. We have Jewish Earth Alliance in DC. We have Dianu, which is a new organization focused partly on political mobilization. Um, we have the Religious Action Center of the URJ of the Reform Movement. Um, Hazan is part of a thing called the Jewish Social Justice Roundtable, which is more than 60 of the Jewish social justice organizations which meet together to coordinate to some extent behind the scenes. Um, and I would add, by the way, and, and, and absolutely rightly, there has been really serious work done, I think, done on racial equity and justice accelerating within the last year or two to try and do that work seriously within the Jewish community and to try and align that as well. So in a general sense, I think that we are going to go into 2021 in this next period with the Jewish community trying to raise its voice, but to some extent following the, the, the lead. 
Hazan was involved in 2007. The last but two farm bills came through Congress. And one of the things that we said is, the American Jewish community stands up on Capitol Hill and says we're against anti-Semitism, stands up on Capitol Hill and says we're against the tax on Israel. How can it possibly be that food is so central to Jewish life and the farm bill has just come through Congress and the American Jewish community doesn't have anything to say about it? And so we were one of two organizations that set up what became the Jewish Working Group on the Farm Bill. It was originally six organizations. We extended it to 20. We lobbied in the end on two specific issues. And both of them, on the one hand, ended up in the final bill. But on the other hand, the process was so crazy, so complicated, so horrific, we had no presumption whatsoever that we made any difference at all. And I think that it really taught us that we need the largest coalitions and we need people who have the heft to do the policy work and the serious lifting. And that our job at those levels is to try and put the Jewish community behind work that's happening. That leads me really to the second thing that I, I, I wanted to say. I, I did want to say a word about Hanukkah and hope and going back literally to how Rosenda began. Um, there aren't that many Jews in the world, but we have tried to punch above our weight in terms of trying to help make a better world for everybody. Um, and it's kind of interesting that a lot of stuff has been thrown at the Jewish people over the last 20 centuries. And yet to some extent it has been our tradition to come through it with a sense of hope. And I think it does partly go back to the Hanukkah story. And um, I just wanna say three things about Hanukkah because this is the Maccabees, 150 years before the time of Jesus. And the primary story is the temple has been destroyed. They finally reclaimed it. They've only got enough oil for one day and they need it to last for eight. And that's the miracle of Hanukkah and it's why we light Hanukkah is today. And I think there are three things that are really interesting about that as we literally light Hanukkah lights today across the Jewish world and something that we've said. Firstly, this is the time that as a planet, we have to make our natural resources last eight times longer than they're on track to do so. They have to stay in the ground for eight times longer than we're in the process of taking them out. And when we light Hanukkah candles, and we've said this in the Jewish community, that's a new message of Hanukkah. Second thing, I think it's really important for all of us to remember, I'm really struck by this as I go around the country and teach. When you raise the issue of climate, people get depressed. It's one of the reasons that we're not collectively more apparent. Because when you raise the issue, people start to think about it and they're like, oh my God, A, it's doom and gloom, the planet's gonna be destroyed. And B, I'm so small, what kind of a difference can I make? And see, I feel guilty. I have two cars, I do this, I do that, whatever it may be. And I think that the story of Hanukkah, but not only the story of Hanukkah, is the story of a small number of people making a difference. And I say that to every person who's on this call, from every faith tradition, and all of the people who are joining in, it's actually important for us to remember to have a sense of hope in this work and to realize that we are steadily growing and that acknowledging that sense of despair and engaging it is itself part of what religious communities can bring to the wider discourse. And the last thing is about light in the darkness. And it goes back to, um, to Rashenda talking about hope at the start. The late Lord Sachs, the chief rabbi, uh, Orthodox chief rabbi in England who died last month, made a distinction between optimism and hope. He said, optimism is the expectation that things will be better. Hope is the, the determination that we should make things better. And so if you ask me if I'm optimistic about the US political system or the trajectory for the world, I'm not necessarily. But if you ask whether I'm hopeful, I believe it is a religious imperative that we be hopeful. The late um, Hugo Grin, who was one of the great rabbis, the 20th century reform rabbi in England, was the son of a Holocaust survivor. And his father was a kid in a concentration camp. And Hugo told this story. His father was a kid and his father in the concentration camp somehow had a little bit of margarine and found a wick and was about to light a Hanukkah candle. And they really needed food. And the kid said to his father, how can we waste this on a, on a flame, on a candle? And his father said to him, people can go three weeks without food they can go three days without water. 
but they can't go three hours without hope. So there are lots of different kalakias. This is, if you can see it, this is a particularly unusual and unorthodox one. If people can make it out, you might be able to figure out why this is different from an, uh, 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 a traditional kalakia. I'll leave that there for a second. Oh um, my God, is that a Hanukkah bomb? bomb? Did you just show us a Hanukkah bomb? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes it is, just so that people can know it was a gift to us from a couple of years ago. There's a reason I want to do it, by the way, because I want to say this is really, really the last thing. I'm actually going to light one of these candles. We started Hazan with a bike ride across America. We rode 3,000 miles from Seattle, Washington to Washington, D.C. to raise environmental awareness in the Jewish community. And we stopped at churches, synagogues, we did press and TV. We got an award from the EPA at the White House. Um, this is not a traditional kind of tier either. But all of us are both heir to our traditions and are taking them forward in the 21st century. It's true for native people, it's true for evangelicals, it's true for Catholics. And so to the extent that on the one hand, lighting Hanukkah candles is 2000 years old, but on the other hand, this is a new and a different kind of Hanukkah. I literally just wanna light this right now. And I wanna light this to, to inspire all of us with a sense of hope and determination going forwards and with the possibility of renewing all of our traditions for good. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah, da 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 Gather round together. I forget the words, but I love that song. Happy Hanukkah, everyone, and thank you for that blessing. Happy and Hanukkah. This is really a joyful moment. <laughs> so, um, well, Todd, Todd, before you ask that question, uh, Nigel, I'm going to send you my address, and I need to borrow that um, uh, Hanukkah <laughs> for just for the weekend. I'll, I'll send it back to you. We're gonna, we're all gonna borrow it. I think that's one, the multiple faith bong, that would be the interfaith bong, that's a new one. Um, but the house is ahead of us, they've legalized it, so we're on the path. Oh my goodness, that, anyway, well, that's a, we should explore these uh, variations and, and ritual gatherings on the Zoom of world. All right, um, next up we have Reverend Fletcher. Um, Reverend, you're in the, all the circles and, you know, you know how it's organized and how it's not organized. So, um, and we're not going to figure this out today, but do you, I would guess I would ask you, do you agree that there is a need for more formalized national and, you know, throughout a system of state, the corporations are organized, by the way, if you don't know this, the opposition is in a pyramid of corporate power. They don't have to deal with all these machinations and that's why they're so powerful. We have vast more power, I believe that, but it is extremely decentralized. So this is what my whole mission in this is. I was here and I'm like thousands of climate groups. I, it's, I, it's unbelievable really, the potential. Um, but until it's harnessed and, and speaking as one and working as one, it's not gonna be effective. And I think the reality of the moment of where we stand proves that, bears that out because we have all these great things, but yet we have no results. So. I would you know, love to hear your perspective on this and any interest you might have in helping us to forge a more formal collective staffed machine to organize, because even with all the bills, if we had one organization said, okay, these are the 20 bills we're fighting for. And here they are listed on one side, here are all the action days. You know, Just that basic kind of organization would be extremely helpful to the outside world to which all of this is just an overwhelming issue because they don't see how to plug in. You know, it's the infrastructure is not transparent. So with that, a big setup again. And then we'll invite everybody um, to have one last minute to give us some closing thoughts. And then we'll invite Reverend Rashinda back for um, some closing remarks. So Reverend uh, Fletcher, please take it away. Sure, and I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how exactly direct an answer I'll give, but I'll, I'll share two thoughts. Um, one is, as I said before, um, we are concerned about the dire state that we face and are more, I think, deeply moved at this point by figuring out how do we try to shift the culture 
to make things politically possible that currently aren't. Because the reality at this moment is that there is not anywhere close to the political will to make changes at the scale or speed that's needed. And I say that with full appreciation for the fact that Biden's plan is by a wide margin, the most ambitious that any president elect has ever crafted and reflects more of the principles and commitments that all of us have been working towards for years. But we're way behind and it's not enough. Um, so I think that's one piece is for us, the, the big question is how do we shift the culture and I think that's a different question than the one you asked, Todd, and I don't mean to be evasive, but that's just, that's the question we're thinking about. Um, I think the second piece connects with a great deal of what Roberto said a while back. I mean, at, at our heart, Green Faith is a grassroots focused organization. And so we look at um, how do we elevate leadership from the margins that is what is able to move the center. We've seen in the history of the religious environmental movement that early on the margins were where this movement started. I think that those of us who are in the grassroots end of this movement owe it to our colleagues who try very hard to move the centers of these different denominations and religions to push really hard so that new things become possible at the center. Um, I think that the same is true for the relationship between the grassroots and staffed national organizations, which by their very nature face the challenge of what does it mean to represent uh, the voices that aren't adequately represented at the table. I'm, I'm not a believer in one centralized voice speaking for all. I think that's too much of a concentration in one place. And I think that what's needed is a really vigorous debate that combines what the science tells us about what's needed and what our values tell us about what we stand for. That's the debate that we're interested in. And I think that different groups will have to make decisions about where they stand along the spectrum of response in relationship to that. But I think as a religious person, I think our job is not to calibrate what's politically possible. I think it's to say what's morally required. So to me, that's where, that's where our thinking is. And, Robert Fletcher, and I think just on a, on a really practical level where that leads us is how do we, you know, how do we say uh, to more big cities like New York City and more states like New York State, what the hell are you doing investing in the fossil fuel sector? How dare you? You know, and saying that to big, big players, to saying to, you know, the, the uh, governor of Minnesota, what are you doing allowing line three to go forward? Are you crazy? So I, I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of a sort of a raw grassroots voice. I think it's an Irish saying, is this a private fight or can anybody get involved? And my feeling is we, we, need, uh, we need that very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, this conversation is obviously gonna be continued. Um, I will say in the immigration fight, I was arrested with 70 faith leaders because there was a bill and a demand that everyone agreed upon. And that's what, when people rise up that's when the saints go marching in. Um, and that's when people are willing to put their lives and bodies on the line for a cause is when it's crystallized around a legislative demand. I've never seen anything else really get through Congress um, that's important or momentous in terms of social change. And the culture has changed to a certain extent, you know, 70% of the people think it's a great thing. So what is the demand that we're all gonna, and we then speak with our own voices and we act in our own way but we have a common goal. So that's the challenge and um, as I see it, and but I think we're on our way to that conversation. Um, so it's five minutes left. Um, I think 
maybe um and could you want to say i know with a group like this big it's hard for us to go around and then save two minutes for Rashunda. um Rashunda, are you there would you like to maybe come in and say your closing remarks and we'll see if we have an opportunity for um what would it take if we did 15 seconds each you want to do 15 well, seconds each? Oh, go ahead. Well, Todd, Todd, let me let me say this. I think that uh, Bishop Fletcher hit on something that was uh, extremely important, not just for you to hear, but for your audience to hear as well. Our goal as faith leaders in this conversation is not necessarily to push legislation, but to push protection for people and planet. And, and what we're saying is we change the conversation from it being this policy conversation to it being a moral conversation. Is it right or wrong? And I think that's what, what Fletcher is saying. And when he said, how in the hell can you pass this knowing that it's full well wrong? And, and that, that is for us as faith leaders, that's, that is right where we land. That sits in our lap for us to say that because we have a prophetic voice that we should be speaking truth, not to pow power, but truth in power mm. and using our authoritative voice to make our uh, uh, demands known that we need our people and our planet protected. Mm -hmm. I feel you and I hear you and I appreciate that. I think that'll be good. And so um, three minutes left, I'm gonna invite Reverend Rashunda and I apologize, we're not gonna get the last 30 seconds from everyone. Um, does anyone feel strongly that they would like to have a last uh, thought? You'd be welcome to. I just want to affirm what Michael just shared. There's a story I really like uh, about a priest who was, uh, he haunted the halls of Congress regularly and was a thorn in the side of his legislator. And his legislator finally got frustrated and said, what would you have me do then, Father? You keep telling me I'm doing everything wrong. And he said to him, it is my job to demand that justice roll down like a mighty water. It is your job to figure out the plumbing. It's reductionist. Of course, we need to be in on the policy discussions, but that is our role, Michael, right? It's our role to demand that justice be done. Uh, and and uh, Fletcher did a great job articulating that too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would like to say just a brief closing? Thought? Yeah, Todd. Yeah, Todd, this is uh, Roberto. Just to, just to bring to everybody's, uh, to their mind at the forefront that Many indigenous peoples right now around the nation are calling for Representative Deb Haaland, uh, calling on Biden to uh, name her as Interior Secretary. So I hope that could be supported uh, by all those here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love when we get specific. Who else would please everyone who hasn't, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing control of the room here because I can't remember who had it. Shanta, would you like to say something brief in closing? Everyone said it, uh, but I will just repeat, uh, as we look at this moral imperative to act, the reason why I have chosen to center my time and my, my remarks so heavily on racial justice is that I believe we will never have the success at a good having a good climate justice policy unless everybody sees themselves respected, reflected, and engaged in both the what and the how of those policies. And that is why racial justice must come right alongside any climate policy development. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we've had the Poor People's Campaign and We Act and, oh, We Act, oh, and NAACP at the other sessions. So it's been a beautiful representation. Um, uh, Roberto, who hasn't gone that would like to say a few less, any closing thoughts? I think we covered it. So, all right, why don't we invite Reverend Rashenda um, to come and close us out. Oh, Jose, did you get to say any last closing thoughts? Please, just a few seconds. No, you're good? Okay. You're welcome to. Go ahead. In, in <coughs> reading of uh, the Catholic saints, uh, humility is absolutely essential to us moving forward. Humility is the foundation of all virtue. Uh, and Todd, you talked about us um, disintegrating our organizational and our individual egos. This has not yet been done in human history as, as demonstrated by Reinhold Niebuhr in his book, Moral Man, Immoral Society. And yet Albert Einstein says we must do completely different from what we are doing now. And um, we just have to have a revolution of thought, an evolution of thought. 
and this is stepping into this is stepping into true application of Jesus's message on a collective level, disintegration of ego, love of each other, love of enemy. This is what we have to take to the table. Thank you, thank you. And I would just add radical emergency organizing. You know, how, the status quo has not worked, right? As beautiful as it is, what are we gonna do new that we haven't done before that is gonna change what's possible? Um, and with that, Reverend Rashinda, are you here? And uh, Nigel, you already passed because you had that lovely moment, so thank you. I don't see, oh, there she is. Welcome back, Reverend Rashinda. Please close us out. Hello, hello. And uh, we are all so uh, capable of offering closings and benedictions, and I am so grateful to be in such good company. Thank you, everyone, for participating today, whether you were a listener or you used your voice to speak. Uh, I'm so grateful for this call to corporate, national, unified morality that, and we, let us let it move us, our bodies, into action. And um, also happy Hanukkah to our Jewish siblings. Hope is with us. So I wanna offer this benediction and blessing as we log out for our break. Uh, this is a benediction for the birds, for the winged messengers of hope. Mm -hmm. God of the Kalama River, of the belted kingfisher, of the great egret, of the tundra swan, God of the blue ridge aquifer, of the white winged scoter, of the tufted duck of the bufflehead, God of the muddy mangroves, of the cedar waxwing, of the great blue heron, of the rough legged hawk, God of the winged messengers that paddle and waddle and quabble and splash, God of the heavens and the earth, protect all the precious creatures of this, your <laughs> wild and precious earth. Amen. Aho. Aho. Amen. Mm. Thank you all so much. This was beautiful and such a blessing. After two days, this is just enriching and nourishing and hopeful. And uh, so we have one more session coming up, six to eight, in People's Climate Movement and Rise and Resist and uh, Extinction Rebellion. So, you know, when the saints go marching in, there's gonna be a lot of them in the streets. And that's who we're talking to next. And then I just invite you all to try to chime in for a little bit to the cabaret, climate cabaret at eight o'clock, which has some really lovely performers from the New York cabaret world um, who are excited to bring their art as a contribution to this cause. And I might actually sing a little song if I have any voice left in that. So thank you all. I want to say I love you all. Thank you so much for everything. I'm very uplifted and affirmed by everything that we're doing and that y'all are doing and just for you being here. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Andrew, can you make me 